I'm Sue Reynolds, and my company is New Market Careers, and I'm here in Santa Clarita. We provide job search assistance and career coaching and executive <laughs> coaching and resume development assistance to managers and executives and senior level professionals. And I make sure that these folks go out and get great jobs, that they negotiate for better compensation, that their resumes actually do something to help them win a job. And the particular experience that I bring to this is that I was a speechwriter for Allied Chemical for years upon years. So I've, my whole career has been managing the messages of executives. And you, one thing you'll notice about me, I'm not an HR girl, not that there's anything wrong with being an HR girl, I come from business communications. <coughs> my career has been in business communications. Now, I think that that is critically important in thinking about what a resume is supposed to <coughs> attempt to accomplish. Because your resume is a brochure about a product. It is a brochure about a product. And it had better do a wonderful job of communicating your skills, your abilities, the types of background that you have that make you pertinent and useful to another, to, to an organization. It had better convey what would make you any different or better than the next person in the next resume. And it had better do it efficiently, clearly, and pretty darn fast. Because I really do believe that your resume stands just a few seconds of a chance to make some sort of an impression. So you need to really think strategically about your resume. Now, what you're going to hear with me today, I, I, I'm a career coach. I've been a career coach for 25 years. So excuse me, you can choose to disagree with me if you want to. But pardon me, been doing this a long time pretty darn successfully and have even been called the resume queen. So you can go ahead and differ with me, but I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns in a pretty strong fashion. So, so but go ahead and argue with me, all right? And, and I believe, for one thing, that there are only two rules in resumes. Only two rules. One is that they be honest that you're never going to misrepresent yourself, and two, that it work, that it work. Now, okay, but here come all of the rules that society is trying to tell you that there have to be. It has to be one page. It has to be two pages. It has to be in Times Roman font. It has to be on cream colored paper. It has to be that you follow the Microsoft Word format that they put inside the template on Microsoft Word. You have to do it that way in that order. <coughs> that you have to have a chronological resume that shows your most recent job first. <coughs> have to, have to, have to. Pardon me. For every single one of the rules that I have just told you, I have seen people become extremely effective in their job searches by doing exactly the opposite of these things. Okay? So, now, that means that every rule that you ever heard can be broken, except that you be truthful. Now, let's talk about the Microsoft Word thing. Microsoft, you know, thank you Bill Gates, they thought that they were being nice to us, that they were going to put a template in there, right, that that would make it convenient and easy for us to go in and fill in the blank. Yes, thank you very much, that was very, very kind of them. But somehow it got in people's heads that that was now the rule. No, that was just Microsoft trying to be helpful. They also give you a template for a, 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 an envelope and a template for a letter. They're just trying to, so, so there's nothing about that template that is a rule, okay? All right, and, and again, the one page, two page thing, or uh, by the way, I wrote the curricula vitae for the woman who is the head of pathology at Henry Mayo Hospital, Barbara Florentine. Her curricula vitae is 17 pages long, okay? It did its job for her, right? You do whatever it takes 
to quickly and efficiently convey. And in her case, she needed to completely convey the entire detail of her career. Okay? So, now, you'll hear a lot of theory that, that I mean, you'll say, you'll say, oh, well, no, every time I try to show uh, some other resume format, I, I go into the human resources department or I go into the temp agency and they turn around and they say, oh, no, 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 you, you have to have this this way or you have to have that that way. <coughs> well, for one thing, one of the rules that I just stated is that your resume has to work. Well, that, here's where it gets even dicier. If it's going to work, it has to be palatable to your reader. Okay? So, palatable or tasty. So we're going to talk about how to do tasty resumes. Because if you try to get real creative with your resume, and you hand it to somebody where it is so out of the box that they literally cannot accept it. it. For them, it's wrong. Now, here's where you're going to get that push and shove and that back and forth where you will basically have to negotiate with yourself and with whoever you are ever presenting a resume to where did you actually <coughs> achieve giving them what they would find tasty so that you got your point across quickly and efficiently and effectively, but that they found it tasty and thus they're willing to, to help you go further, right? Because I have had many people where the best possible way for them to present themselves would have been a functional format or kind of what I'll, I'll teach you as a hybrid format that that would have been what makes them look best, makes them look best. But if they are using the, the world of agencies and recruiters to attempt to get a job, they are going to find people that will tend to not like that format. Mm -hmm. Now, who can tell me why a temp agency or human resources employee would tend to not like a functional resume. They don't know where you work and what you did at that specific situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and why is that so important to, to them? Why are they worried about where you worked and what you did in that situation? Because they can't read between the lines. Yeah, they can't read between the lines. So in other words, they're worried about falling, falling for your good marketing. They're worried about falling for your good marketing. So chronological resumes are great and, and again, I'm going to write up here, the darlings of HR and the agency world, okay? The reason that they like a chronological resume is because they can see exactly what you just did. The company you worked for, the title you had. I have a very dear friend who is a senior level recruiter that he tells me, I only want to know their title, how many people did they supervise, what budget did they supervise, and what's the name of the organization. That's what I all want to know. So in other words, all of the other things that you might have told them that would have made you different and better than the next person, he's telling you he doesn't care because he's going to make his entire judgment about you based on your title, your budget, and the number of people you supervised. Well, it may not be in your best interest that that's all you're telling him, right? And, and what, what's going to happen then? If that's the way you've been presented to a person like that, then sure, they will give you exactly the position you just had. Mm -hmm. Your last job had better be exactly what you're trying to duplicate right now. So now, can you show me, by a show of hands in the room, how many of you feel that the job that you just had is, is what you'd like to duplicate? I want exactly what I just had. <coughs> Anybody? Okay. And now I will ask you exactly what you just had, because I thought you told me you were transitioning. Um, they're phasing my job out. Like, yeah. what a transition. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, so realistically, I'm not going to let you, because she was in my, my networking class a moment ago, so that's why I'm picking her. 
that, that, that now is your, is that a realistic target? Now your answer needs to become no. Right. All right. So you, you folks who said that the job you just had, does it still exist? Is the industry still strong? Are the types of companies still strong? That you can duplicate exactly what you were doing. Okay. So for those of you who that answer is yes, then you have an easy slam dunk answer that the chronological resume is going to serve you great. Because what you're marketing is exactly what there still is a wonderful buying audience for. So take a moment. Everybody have pencil and paper here in this room? Mm -hmm. Please everybody write down the kind of company or organization that is your target. The industry, the size and type of company, make sure that you've, that you've written down a target. So for instance, I've met Kelly, right Kelly? Uh -huh. That Kelly's a brand new nursing graduate, so obviously her targets are any kind of a healthcare environment. It might be a hospital, it might be a long-term care facility, but definitely she's got kind of a clear target of, of where, the, where the right people are going to be. Now, can each of you write down the title, the probable title, of the person to whom you would want to report. Are you somebody that's going to report directly to a company owner? Are you going to report to a controller? Do you have a handle on what the title is of the person to whom you would like to report? I had some folks that were nonprofit folks in my earlier session. So can you say that it's, I want to report to the executive director of a nonprofit? Or maybe I want to be the executive director, so I'm going to be reporting to boards of directors, right? So everybody kind of got that. So that's my, that's the first little piece of. So now, I think the rest of you, by mathematical logic, the rest of you, may did it maybe an industry is has diminished for you, or the job that you used to have is literally just not what's available in the marketplace now. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay. So that means that the batch of you are transitioning your skills. So you're not going to get a job where you go in and say, I'm a great tool and die maker, and I want to go right down here to College of the Canyons and I want to get a job as a tool and die maker. Nope, not going to happen. Dead industry gone. What are some of the other declined and dead industries? Print, print advertising. Print. Yep, the whole printing industry is very, very much struggling. Yeah, so, so printers. All right. As a matter of fact, I'm going to kind of pick on the kind of printing thing. That'll be kind of a, a good thing to, to utilize. You can pick on it. Okay. I've been in the industry. Yeah. You can pick on it. Okay. Real estate. Yeah. Real estate. Construction. Small so, business. Yeah, yeah, small Poor small business. business. That's not true. See, I, uh, I was going to say, hey, that's not true. And, and, and small business is, is too big of, of a category. So maybe, um, small well, small manufacturing, but on the, uh, like if I said, okay, my friend Kevin Leahy, who recently closed his, ca his Candleman. Candleman store <coughs> and moved up to Oregon. Well, I'm sure Kevin would tell you that this was a rough economy to try to do a highly specialized, gift-oriented retail store, right? But I don't know about you, but there's an awful lot of really busy restaurants in this town, and I don't know where the recession is at egg plantation or something. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. It's still there. Well, sure, the recession's everywhere. The recession's everywhere. But, but indeed, there are still certain types of companies that are thriving more than others. So I'm not going to let, 
I'm not going to let you take an, a completely broad brush and say all of small businesses it's, decline. It's the luxury businesses. The luxury businesses. I wouldn't want to be in the in in the jewelry industry right now. Small retail. But yeah. Now and and I and I now let's not turn this into a an economic complaint session, but. But it still, I, I sat at a networking event with a lot of realtors the other day, and a gal was talking about somebody coming in and paying $700,000 cash for a house. So, you know, for every folk that there's struggles, there, there are, there's opportunity for others. But let me, let me stay on track here. Okay. So those of you that are thinking about the fact that the industry that you were just in is going to change, then you're probably going to be attempting to do some sort of a functional or hybrid resume. And you may even get off into biographies, but I'll try to make sure then. That's going to be an if we have time kind of a Sorry. scenario. Oh, okay. Is there a way to Sorry. kind of change your industry? Like, you know, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's I'm going to talk about. I'm in the massage industry, and most people, you know, think spots. Because it's, it's a. And uh, really, I'm not just the only one there. Out there that want to change it more into the health side. Right. Well, so let's use her as an example. So her target as a massage therapist, she's trying to get away from the luxury market and go more to the health and physical therapy market, <coughs> right? Yeah. Well, then that means that her target, it's no longer going to be that she's trying to target spas and resorts and be the massage therapist at a spa. She's going to try to be a massage therapist at a chiropractic office or in a hospital or some other. So remember me saying you got to think about your target audience so that you can start to, to define your resume. Okay. So then, now, those of you that were in my networking class a few minutes ago, I want you to write down the actual services that you provide. So in your career, what are the actual tasks? that you do. So if you're in IT, what are the tasks that you can do? If you're a nurse, what are the tasks that you do? If you're in sales, define sales, define the task of selling. So everybody take a few minutes and write some things down. Okay, so functional would be tasks, services, duties. So what are some of the tasks or services or capabilities that any of you write down? Customer service. Educating about products and research and problems. Product. on to the public. Product research. I'm sorry, what else did you say? Lay us on. Um, for the public and the company, I guess. Mm -hmm. What other services? Anybody? Problem solving. <clears throat> Create opportunity. And by create opportunities, do you mean kind of a sales environment? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Help people see things differently. Mm -hmm. A functional resume 
usually begins with some sort of descriptive headline. And by the way, in, in my personal practice, let's pretend I've got a two-page functional resume. I usually start out with the person's name, and I use just email and phone. I don't necessarily use snail mail anymore because it's just kind of not necessary. Waste of space. Waste. I consider a resume to be uh, real estate that I have available to me, and I'd better make the most of it. So you'll find that I, that I think a lot according to the idea that if I don't have to write it, I'm not going to. And then I come out with, with a title. So it might be sales and business development. Now notice I didn't really say sales of what. I went right out with a, with a main title. Then you know, maybe I'll then say some subheads that are, that are some of these uh, uh, subheads like um, problem, create, creating sales opportunities, eliminate competition, other tasks that a salesperson would have. Then a functional resume usually then has some lists of accomplishments. So now, take a few minutes and think in your career, if you think of the tasks that you've, that you've done for folks, write down a couple of the accomplishments for your organization or in your career that you are most proud of. Write down a couple things that you're really proud of. I'm not giving you enough time, am I? Has everybody got two? Am I going too fast? Anybody that doesn't have two accomplishments written there? Okay. Somebody shout out for something that they've achieved in their career that they're really proud of. Embracing change. And I'm going to, and now I'm going to go deeper. And in what way did that embracing change cause a result for a, 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 in your capacity of your work? How did that change cause a positive result for an organization? Show historical proof is how to use the internet and how online marketing is the way of the future. And can you even begin to conjecture? What kind of revenue improvement that might have caused to happen? Top line or bottom line? Top line, more products and services to sell. Bottom line being more cost effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who else can tell me an accomplishment? Yes. Um, created fundraising materials that helped to land a five million dollar grant for General Motors. Sweet. Sweet. I guess this was worth the trip. <laughs> I don't know. Um, anybody else? For me, it's a bachelor's degree in kinesiology. Okay. Which gives me a better knowledge of how the body works. Don't let me forget that I want to come back to this because we'll, I'm going to show you some tricks of using something like that later. Okay, what, what these two achievements have been able to illustrate is that there was a situation or challenge or problem that 
either they in their position or that the organization was addressing. So your statement of your accomplishments needs to start out with what was the situation that you were trying to solve. And, and of course, archaic marketing methods and, and lack of, of sales productivity, um, lack of funds, right? So, so always start out, when you think of your accomplishments, say to yourself, okay, what was the situation that I, then what did you do? That I enacted a, uh, I embraced change and caused an organization to embrace change by, by bringing to, to the organization online marketing concepts, which then led to both top and bottom line results. Now, so he stated, he stated that he brought these services into the organization, that he then caused these top and bottom line results to happen. Hers is even more easy, easy to understand. She raised funds and got a $5 million grant from GM. So the, the result is very, very clear. So make sure that all of your statements of accomplishments attempt to say what you did and try to use action words that I sold or I produced or I wrote or I conducted. So action words and that there's a statement of a result. Now, how many people in my room are engineers or IT people or finance folks? Anybody? Okay. I always try to tell my, my folks that the plus or minus is your friend. Because I'll sit with my clients, I write resumes with folks day in, day out, and my engineers and my, my uh, finance folks will go, I don't have those numbers. I mean, I don't know whether it was $5.2 million or 5.3.6. Look. Within the realm of being honest, it is okay to estimate. It, it, be, be truthful that you had the result, but go ahead and convey a percentage of change that you think, go ahead and guess, guess the dollars, guess by how much it changed, give the, the delta for change. Be, be willing to use numbers, because numbers speak very, very loudly, and don't worry about well, okay, well, I don't remember whether it was really $60 or $65. It really kind of doesn't matter. That you increased it by 25% matters. And it might be the thing that differentiates you from somebody else. Okay? So, so now, having done this, can I get several of you to go back and write maybe another couple of accomplishments? And try to have some examples of things that you achieved? One of the problems that I see people have is they'll say, well, I was a sales manager and we increased sales. And then that's all they think they've got to say. Well, no, you can break that up into, well, you know, we, we saved that customer and we beat that competition. So don't be afraid to break your accomplishments up into multiples of accomplishments, okay? Making sure everybody's got some accomplishments written down. Now, I'm going to now go to this issue of education. And I'm assuming that most of you have resumes kind of half written or partially written or beautiful resumes. Remember my, my element that there are no rules about what happens in what order. If you have an educational background that is absolutely the most important and impressive thing about your career. For instance, I recently worked with a gentleman that is a Fulbright scholar, uh, speaks eight languages, and, and went to Washington University in, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and so, somebody from Harvard, somebody with, with a major, major educational account, summa cum laude, uh, top valedictorian of a class. It may be that your education and your degree is the thing that's going to be what gets you hired. I recently wrote a resume for a gal who is a um, pharmacy technician. And she had been an employee of Countrywide for years and years. Well, guess what? She's not going back to Countrywide, is she? Go back to B and A. Yeah, going okay, and, and out of that too. Well, so she went to the trouble of getting her pharmacy technician, and and it's that education now that is the number one thing about her career that is marketable. 
And the fact that she worked in a customer service capacity at Countrywide does almost nothing to help her get a job. And if anything, it's going to kill her, right? Mm -hmm. So now, now you see a, a wonderful example that she wants exactly the opposite of the position that she just had. And by telling you that she was in customer service and loan documentation for Countrywide is going to really kill her trying to get a job, well then sure enough, the HR folks and the agency people, they're going to look at her and go, no, 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 um, we don't have anything for you because what you exactly were was a loan documentation person at Countrywide. So when we get a financial services position, we'll help you out with that. So do you see that her resume, remember me saying that it's the palatability in your audience? Well, now her decision would be then, okay, I'm going to ignore everything about the chronological conventions and I'm going to use a functional resume. And the first thing I'm going to show them is my really nifty education. And then we went down and we even featured certain classes that she had taken because if she presents herself to a pharmacy, they want to see that she knows what she's doing with the drugs, right? So in her resume, it talked about the title that she wanted and some of her, her functional capabilities. And then it says, here's my pharmacy tech degrees, here's all my classes. And in her case, it was a one-page resume. And she got a job as a pharmacy tech. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Can she, would she have listed her background, um, the functions of doing loan documentation that would make her attention to detail or uh, all that kind of stuff? Yes, and we did use things like that. We, we, we wrote in some accomplishments of customer service. That, that were carefully phrased to be transitional so that the, the, the phrasing did not say, I processed loans for excellent blah, blah, blah. It was, I provided excellent prompt customer service in a timely fashion and solved a myriad of problems. So, so there is an example of, of a transitional accomplishment. Here's another, here's another uh, good example for you. I helped a gentleman who was a sergeant major in the Army for years upon years, and he was about to be sent for his second tour to Iraq. Now, we can all thank him for his service, but he finally said, you know, that's enough of this. I'm ready to be out, and I'd like to do something different. Now, if you walk around with a resume that says, I'm an Army guy, do you want me? We all would love him, but we can't hire him, right? So we put together a functional resume because the thing that really, after I really interviewed and, and interviewed him, the functional tasks that he had to be so proud of was he, he could build a hospital in a desert tonight. And do you want to bridge with that? <laughs> he, he could move all of the people and machines and resources around this planet and have it done tonight. And, that, and so logistics, man, you know, the operational project management was logistics. So we wrote down all of what that kind of would be, and then we wrote some of the samples, the examples of the accomplishments that you know, I achieved this project in this kind of a timely fashion. But we didn't say tanks and soldiers and stuff. We said project and materials and resources. So it was very readable and very palatable. Remember me using the tasty, very tasty for the reader, okay? Then, of course, we still said, and he's a sergeant major. He'd been at Guantanamo Bay. He'd been Japan, and then all over the United States. I mean, this is one of these people that we really have to thank for their service to our country, because his family lived in like eight or nine different states. And so I am proud to say that he is now working as a operations manager for a large healthcare warehousing firm here in town. And guess what he does? He supervises groups of guys moving stuff around. <laughs> right? Nice $90,000 job. I'm proud to say in this gentleman's case, he had never negotiated a salary in his life. Why? Because the government just pays you. What, what you're, you know, you, here's your rank and you get this. So he had no idea how to evaluate his accomplishments. Think of them in a business sense 
and then convey that into a document that served him. Okay? So now that now you've heard an example of a wonderful functional resume. Alright? Whereas back to chronological, that's where, okay, I'm a controller and I'm gonna be accounts payable and accounts receivable and pay and payroll and et cetera. And that's exactly what I did over here, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do now. All right? Now, are, are everybody kind of comfortable with this? Would you like to know what I mean by hybrids and biographies and CVs? Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay, now. What tends to happen for people that are IT and unit like finance? Engineering, um, physicians, physician, disciplines, entire disciplines. So I'm, I'm going to use as an I, an IT person. If if you tried to write either a chronological or functional resume, what they've got is this entire mass of software that they know how to run, and then they have an entire mass of hardware that they've touched. And then they've got an entire batch of applications that they've, that they've dealt with, okay? And to try to write under a chronological format, it would become so repetitious, so difficult to read, that the first thing that happens is that the reader really just gives up and, and doesn't bother reading it. I also find, by the way, with all of the technical disciplines, you have to be very, very careful that your reader is actually going to understand what you're talking about. Now, I really find this with IT and engineering in particular. That, that it might, and I'm gonna, I, I, those of you in my prior session, you know that I picked on my poor deceased husband, I'm gonna do it again. My husband was a fabulous chief financial officer, very, very senior level guy, and he was absolutely the opposite of a computer savvy guy. So, yet he had all of information technology reporting to him, but he also had the legal department and all of HR and all of finance, like many CFOs have. But now, if you're an IT guy trying to sell yourself to this man, and you come up and tell him that you do, you know, that you have blah, 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 Mass 90, and this, this software and that software, he has no idea what you're talking about. But now, what would help him understand your capabilities? The benefits, the results. So a person, a reader like that really loves your accomplishments. When you can talk about having implemented a system that changed this to that, your, your example of having ha had that bottom line result, now you're talking to that reader. So I need all of you to really think through that have you really come up with some good examples that, that your reader is really going to understand what their result is going to be from having worked with you. But the, the hybrid resumes would tend to have these same little headlines, but instead of going right to, you know, here's what my job was, and instead of going right to all of my various accomplishments, there might be tables or lists of the kinds of technologies that these folks have operated with, okay? Right, so that's, and, and, a, and a hybrid then will either be a hybrid chronological or a hybrid functional in that, okay, after you've talked about all the softwares and all the technologies and all of the machines, then you still go back and say, okay, and here's what job I was just at or here's the next job that I was at and here's my education, right, okay? A biography is a very useful device in that those of you that are trying to transition to something quite entirely different than what you're doing might be well served. Or those of you, who's, who's running a small business now? Okay. So here's where you have to make a, really a brochure for yourself that obviously has your name and contact information. But one type of biography that I'm finding very, very useful with people is we state the target over here and some of those functional capabilities. And then we very briefly list some of the jobs and then we, and just titles and years and then maybe some, uh, here's the education that they have. And then we have blocks of text 
and bullets, all right? And we tell a really nifty little story of this person's capabilities. And an example currently, a gentleman that I'm working with, was an operations fellow in large, a large construction and architecture firms, but he's got a lot of nonprofit experience, and he wants to get an executive directorship in nonprofit. So we've written the targets of nonprofit executive and, and some examples of the functions of an executive director in nonprofit. Okay? And then we've come over and we've told his story of narratively why you would want to hire him as a nonprofit executive. And then we've thrown in a couple of these little accomplishments, written very carefully to be palatable to the reader, and then continue the narrative story. So do you see that this is completely out of the box? This, this doesn't even really look like a resume at all. And so if you hand it to Susie Q, the HR clerk, probably going to go, well now, and can you give me your resume? Right? So always think about the tastiness and the palatability in the reading. Then the definition of a CV is a curricula vitae. This is where you would normally see these things in medical, education or academia, and, and, and the sciences, okay? Because these are documents that have to actually convey every single piece of, every speech they've ever given, every article they've ever written, every, every position they've ever had, long narrative, not only where were their major degrees, but every single course and seminar that they've taken. And it's completely important that they have all of them. So again, Barbara Florentine at Mayo Hospital, what, a, what an amazing woman, head of pathology for Mayo Hospital, and it's a 17-page long curricula vitae. And, and she, you know, she's spoken here and there, and she's written all these articles, that's what a curricula vitae would do. So now, with the time that we have available. Five minutes to wrap up, please, then we're getting ready for lunch. Okay. <laughs> Fire away with questions. Um, can you explain again who uses the biography? My husband has a small business um, of manufacturing. Is that the type of person? If he was looking to phase out and go someplace and else. Does he want a, a new job or is he trying? So is, um, is he trying to go from a small manufacturing business into a company where he would be in the manufacturing department on the floor? Yeah. Okay. Then, then possibly, yes, uh, an, an example again, uh, I've got a gentleman where we wrote a biography, he was in a manufacturing environment, but has started an international manufacturing consultancy. Because he's the guy that can help you figure out whether you should be manufacturing something in Tijuana or China or Palo Alto or wherever, right? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, with the opposite, with him having come from a small business, I, I might, normally when I'm helping people like him, I usually am headed more toward a functional resume. Oh, okay. The reason would be that he's got strong manufacturing background and, it, and he doesn't want the direct copy of his last job because his last job is his, his little business, right? right? So we don't want him being branded or labeled by that small business, right? So probably a functional resume would have been where I, where I would have headed with him, or I would have gone down a biography line. Biographies are best used when, when you are attempting to promote a small business, promote, where you're coming out of industry and going into self-employment, and you're now trying to promote yourself that way, or where you are so entirely changing what you were trying to do. Like my fellow where he was in the architectural firm management and now he's trying to help you understand why he ought to be your executive director for your nonprofit organization. I think you had a question though. What type of resume would be best for a, a new young college graduate? Probably functional. Now, let me, let me back up a, a, a second here. Listen to me, uh, the, the, we're, we're talking in these generalities of well, which type of resume would probably be best. Most of my career coaching clients, we have all of them yeah. put together, okay? Because they're gonna go talk to a recruiter. Well, then they need a resume and they're gonna cross their fingers and hope 
that that chronological resume gets the job done and it may or may not work, right? Why? Because it shows their weaknesses in a fashion that's not good for them. But they need a functional resume for another day. But for a new college graduate or somebody who is truly trying to take where, where the work history is not <clears throat> what's going to attract an employer to them. So yes, when I'm coaching at the Connect to Success program where we do high school juniors, I get them to enumerate their, their interests, the, the nonprofit work they've done, the, the various clubs and activities, and then I'm very careful to make sure that they have talked about whatever awards that they've received. I, I'm proud to say that although I normally work with very, very senior level people, I just had a, a, a gal bring her high school daughter to me to, to have help with a resume. So yeah, the, what are the academic awards, the, the activities that they've been participating in, and, and even a 16-year-old kid is going to have some accomplishments to show. And even if they have never worked anywhere, the, the, the skit that we often play at our junior achievement program is, you know, if I'm, if I'm the manager of PetSmart and I want to hire somebody, how about hiring the kid that had, had volunteered at the Castaic Animal Shelter and handled the cash and handled the customer service and cleaned up the cages? As opposed to the kid that had worked in the mall at Hot Topic. Which, which person do I want coming to work for me at PetSmart? And the kid that had been at the Castaic Animal Shelter, shelter has never been paid a dime to work anywhere in their life. Make sense? So there's the use again of a, a young person's functional resume. What other questions can I answer? And this is very hard, folks, and, and there is no easy answer. Well, I just have a question because for me, I have my educational background. Yeah. That is what I That's what you have to sell. Most. Yeah. Thank you for that. On that. Because here, here's something that, that I meant to come back to. Your bachelor's degree is, is a, a key feature thing. The things you learn, the courses you've taken, and the actual disciplines that you've learned and what the potential results of them. So that's what you're going to sell, okay? So, so just like I talked about my pharmacy tech gap, you're going to feature your education and explain what you learned and you're going to explain it in a fashion that you state what the results will be. That, that my, my training in this, Sue, will help you have this result in your health. So do you see that I took an educational accomplishment and conveyed it to a conjectured result? So I wrote an anticipated accomplishment. Well, there must be a rule against that, right? Now, for all of what I've talked about today, I'm sure what you've detected is that my theory that there are only two rules, I just know that's really true, but you're gonna go around and you're gonna say, okay, well here's my two page resume and somebody's gonna say, should have been one page. You're gonna hand somebody a functional resume and they're gonna go, oh no, no, you have to have this, this way. Then you'll hand somebody a chronological resume but you'll have decided to put your oldest job first. And they'll, oh, there must be a rule against that. No. That as long as it's effectively tasty for your audience, and that's your challenge. Yes, ma'am. Tasty headshot or no headshot? I, I use headshots for people that are in, a, like, like sales disciplines, PR disciplines, where, where maybe a community liaison type of person, where something about your appearance is part of what you're trying to sell, and the fact that part of what they're asking you to do is to go out and be effective with the public. And, and for instance, I, I did a bio for a gal where we, her goal, she, she is a very, very senior person in the courts administration organization. So we put her headshot here and we wrote this kind of bio thing and all of her degrees, oh my God, she's an educated person. And it's because she wanted boards of directors jobs. You know, she wanted to be added to boards of directors. Whereas a lot of times I write these, you know, I mean, Michael Holt, I'm not sure I put his name. What else? Yes, sir. Quick question. This two-page resume thing. Mm -hmm. This 17-page CV. Yeah. 
Everybody's just scanning devices now. I was told two pages doesn't matter. Well, put no. down, put down what's important. And yeah. if it's three pages or four pages, that's reality because the scanning devices are looking at the number of pages. But, but see, now you'll get me into a whole other topic of this job sure search okay. strategy. Yeah. Because if you're ever looking at a woman that's networking, you know, 60 to 80 percent of great jobs <coughs> come from word of mouth, not from Monster Hot Jobs or, or, or Craigslist. So you'll, I, I. Ask yeah, scanning, schmanning, whatever. So sure, sure. Go ahead and have the document. Let it be as long as you want. If you're willing to accept that you're also going to get off the internet, 100% commission drives for selling water softeners. That's cool. There. But 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 I will absolutely tell you that 60 to 80 percent of everyone's job search efforts should be to try to get yourself in front of great connections with the decision makers that you need, not in front of a scanning device. So there's, there's my fast answer. Yeah. So yes, sure, three pages, whatever. I almost don't care. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome.